During the winter months, workers remove tubs full of young oysters from beneath the floating rafts and carry them inside to a surgical assembly line. Workers pry the oysters open one by one and implant what will become the nucleus of a cultured pearl. Around this nucleus, the pearl oyster will lay down layer upon layer of calcium until it is built a pearl. When the operation is finished, the oysters are placed on wire racks and returned to the bay to grow until harvest. Periodically, the Japanese clean the oysters of barnacles and seaweeds to improve growth rates. After about three years, workers again pry open each pearl oyster, this time hoping to retrieve a marketable gem. Only about one-third of the pearl oysters survive until harvest. Three in a hundred will produce a truly valuable gem. Nevertheless, that rate of success is much better than in nature. One of Japan's leading pearl producers, the Mikimoto Company, processes 3,000 pearls a day, grading them according to size, luster, shape, color, and flawlessness. A single strand of cultured pearls can be worth a hundred thousand dollars. The Japanese were quick to recognize the vast potential of aquaculture to produce income and jobs. In some cases, they have found ways to blend old traditional fisheries with new sea farming techniques. The ocean around Shikoku Island is full of tiny bait fish. Fishermen have long been able to catch more than they could sell. Aquaculturists, on the other hand, have wanted to raise high-value carnivorous fish, such as the yellowtail, but the cost of feeding them has been too high. Today, fishermen and sea farmers work together. The fishermen catch bait fish and sell them to the sea farmers, who feed them to the yellowtail. In the process, the two groups have become dependent upon each other. Japanese fishermen now sell 20% of their catch to sea farmers. With this dependable source of feed, sea farmers have created a new industry and pioneered new seafood markets. In recent years, yellowtail meat has become a favorite food in Japan. tradition of aquaculture is well established in the East. It did not begin in Japan, however. The Chinese were practicing aquaculture 4,000 years ago, but they were doing it in fresh water. It is said the Chinese emperors were the first patrons of fish farming. They loved to eat fish, and they insisted on being served fresh fish year-round. The object of their patronage was the carp, a fish still held in high esteem. In 475 B.C., Fan Li wrote the first account of what he called water husbandry. His guide to raising carp was based on sound scientific principles that are still basic to fish culture. The Chinese have an ancient saying, if you give a person a fish, he will have food for one day. If you teach him to grow fish, he will have food for a lifetime. The words hold true in modern China where aquaculture has become an important source of food. In fact, China now leads the world in pounds of cultured fish produced. The Chinese have developed one of the most elegant and efficient forms of aquaculture, 
growing not one, but many varieties of fish in a single pond. This system is called polyculture. It is based on the efficient use of energy and nutrients that pass through the pond. Carp ponds like these can be found in many of the southern provinces of China, in the new territories of Hong Kong and on Taiwan. Ducks and other livestock fertilize the water with their droppings. Beneath the pond surface we find many kinds of carp, each feeding at a different level in the food chain, all surviving in harmony. Feeding at the surface on aquatic plants or vegetable greens supplied by the grower is the grass carp. Further down in the water column is the big head carp that feeds on tiny aquatic animals and the silver carp that feeds on tiny plants. The mud carp eats bottom dwelling creatures and decayed plant and animal matter. It shares this ecological niche with the common carp. In some ponds one might also find black carp feeding on snails and clams. In China, aquaculture is driven by the country's need to produce as much food as possible from each acre of land. In the United States, a country already rich in agricultural products, the motivation for those wishing to culture fish has been economic. When markets for soybeans and other traditional crops faltered, farmers in the Deep South began looking for more profitable ways to use their land. Some farmers diked and flooded their fields, converting them to catfish ponds. Using the same workers and the same tractors that once were busy cultivating row crops, these American farmers produced $200 million worth of catfish in 1983. Sometimes they pulled as much as $180,000 worth from a single pond. Some observers predict this industry will triple in the next 20 years. that catfish live in the ponds, they feed on an expensive mixture of soybeans, fish meal, corn, and wheat. But the conversion rate is high. Each pound of feed converts to about half a pound of fish flesh. By comparison, cattle ranchers get only about one-fifth that yield from their steers. other agricultural models, catfish farmers have organized themselves into the Catfish Farmers of America. The association attempts to standardize product quality and develop new markets. Although catfish sell best in the South, these flash frozen fillets are destined for supermarkets in Chicago, part of the industry's aggressive effort to expand markets. In their diet, Americans do not depend on fish for protein. Maybe they never will. So the challenge to industry lies in convincing consumers that they'd rather eat farm-raised catfish than red meat, poultry, or other seafoods. Not much convincing is needed in Mississippi and Arkansas, where catfish fries are already something of a tradition. 